it's live. It's live. Okay. All right, guys. <clears throat> Sorry. All right, guys. Hello, and welcome to the last episode in our series, which is episode five, where we're going to delve into the Coronavirus Act. Um, we will be introduced ourselves. I am OJ. Me. And I'm I O. <laughs> well done. You got it. Yeah, right got it right this time. This yeah. Okay. Um, as you guys are all aware by now, we are recording all of our episodes via Zoom because of social distancing, but that has meant that we have managed to get an even wider range of panellists on this final episode. It also means that we have our video content available, so you can watch us on YouTube, either live or afterwards, as well as listen to us on your usual podcast platforms. As ever, if you guys have any questions for us that you would like to ask over the course of the episode and you're listening live, then send us a tweet, Instagram, or use the YouTube chat feature, which I and I will keep an eye on and we'll put questions to our panellists as and when they come up. Now we are diving into the Coronavirus Act. We've gathered this panel. It consists mostly of barristers. We also have a policy advisor and human rights activist who will briefly outline the legislation's provisions. They'll tell us what impact it's had in their areas of practice and provide you with their overall analysis of its provisions. So I'll hand over them to them to introduce who they are to you and I'll do it in alphabetical order. So first up, we have Alistair Henderson. Hi, uh, my, yeah, my name is Alistair Henderson. I am a barrister in private practice at One Crown Office Royal Chambers. I specialise in public law and human rights, employment discrimination law and medical law. Um, so clinical negligence and inquests, that kind of thing. Um, I'm also one of the commissioners on the board of the Equality and Human Rights Commission. Brilliant. Um, so very well experienced. Next up, we have Fiona Robertson. Hi guys, I'm a barrister at Two Hair Court. Um, I've been working in law and human rights for the last about 12 years in the UK, the Cayman Islands and Ghana, and I specialise in criminal law and professional discipline, so bodies like the General Medical Counseling, Nursing Council, Nursing and Midwifery Council. Fantastic. Next up we have Natasha Shatunde. Hi everyone, my name is Natasha Shatunde and I practice from uh, Garden Court Chambers. I um, mainly practice in family law. I also have a massive passion and interest in human rights and eradicating violence against women. And next we have Susie Staunton. Hi, I am Susie Staunton. I at Clyde & Co, specialising in employment and discrimination. We have two Toms. So the first Tom is Tom Coates Smythe. Hi, my name is Tom Coke Smythe. I'm a barrister in private practice at QEB Hollis Whiteman, and I specialise in uh, crime, uh, professional discipline, and inquests, particularly those involving Article 2. Great, thank you very much, Tom. And then it's our other Tom, Tom Lowell. Hi, guys, my name is Tom Lowell. I'm a barrister practising from St Ives Chambers in Birmingham, and my main practice areas are private children family work and also social housing. Thank you, Tom. And last but not least, we have Zainab Ashan Ramu. Hi, my name is Zainab Ashan Ramu. I am a former parliamentary researcher for a, a former Labour MP. Um, currently, um, I'm working at an organisation called Activate, um, who are passionate about getting um, women from underrepresented backgrounds into elected office. So we are funding them to do that. Um, and also I am former project manager, researcher and policy person for Glitch UK, which is an organisation working to eradicate online violence against women and girls. Well, that's the project I was working on, um, but just online violence against women and girls in general. Fantastic. Okay, so guys, the way that we're going to run this episode is we're going to do a very quick explanation of the Act's background. And then we're going to go into an outline of the scope of the Act, just to give you all an idea of just how wide ranging the provisions of this piece of legislation really are. And finally, we'll go into the general discussion where each of the panellists will draw down on their experiences and hopefully riff off of each other and just share what has been happening on the ground since the Coronavirus Act was passed. So the first part of the episode will be a very short, Zainab, <laughs> rundown of the Act's background. If you could take it away, please. 
Hi everyone. So the emergency coronavirus legislation, the, uh, what we know as the Coronavirus Act 2020, received royal assent on the 25th of March 2020. It was fast tracked through Parliament in just four sitting days, making its round through the House of Commons and the House of Lords. Um, it passed through all stages um, in the Commons in one day without opposition MPs forcing any votes. Um, but this was after Downing Street offered concessions um, that it would the, the the act would be reviewed. Um, every six months. This particular bill will be in place for two years. The legislation grants emergency powers, which consists of a range of emergency measures, to enable public bodies to respond to the challenges presented by the COVID pandemic. Um, and the Act has three main aims, um, to give further powers to the government to slow the spread of the virus, to reduce um, the resourcing and administrative burden on public bodies, and to limit the impact of potential staffing shortages on the delivery of public public services. Um, when, um, when the provisions in the Act take effect. So some of the provisions within the Act, such as the emergency registration of health professionals, take effect on royal assent. So that would have been on the day of the 25th of March. Others, including those relating to emergency volunteers, temporary modifications to mental health legislation and food supply, only take effect when a UK government minister, or in some other cases, a minister of the devolved administrations, makes a regulation switch them on. Um, another thing that you may have heard about a lot is the sunset clause. Um, the, the bill includes a sunset clause which sets a time limit to the legislation. A sunset clause is basically a provision within a bill that sets out the legislation when the legislation will expire um, at, a specific, uh, at a specified point in the future. It is the same effect as when one repeals or revokes legislation and it means that it's no longer law, but anything done under it whilst it was law remains valid. Um, sunset clauses let Parliament reassess the legislation at a later date once it is clearer how it has been used in practice and how suitable it is to policy challenge at hand. Um, and most measures within the Act will stop having an effect after two years. Um, Others, including certain provisions relating to the emergency registration of health professionals and the indemnity of health service activity, do not expire after two years. Um, and just kind of going back to the six month review, um, this is something that opposition MPs and other civil society groups and civil liberty groups um, such as Big Brother called for. Every six month, a, months, a government minister must, as far as practicable, make arrangements for MPs to vote to keep the provisions of the Act in force. If MPs are unable, are able to vote and vote to stop, um, against keeping the provisions of the Act in force, the government must make regulations to prevent provisions have an effect within 21 days. But this is conditional about uh, upon whether MPs will be sitting in Parliament or not. MPs will only be able to vote on the continuation of the powers if Parliament is sitting. If it's not, um, they're un and, they're, and they are not able to vote, the powers will remain in force. Um, power to change the expiry date of the Act. A UK minister, I think I mentioned before, and in some cases a minister of the devolved authorities, may make a regulation to extend some provisions of the Act beyond the two-year time period for a maximum of six months. The time period may also be reduced, so the same minister also has the right to end provisions within the Act six months earlier than the sunset date within the Act states. Um, so in regards to scrutiny, the government will have to publish reports every two months on the use of the Act, and there will also be a parliamentary debate in both houses held one year after assent. And that is where this ends. I think I kept Well done, Zayla. Ah, well done, you kept the time limit. <laughs> <in it. laughs> I'm proud of you. Um, yeah, Zayna, but only non-barrister, I think, would probably be the only person who keeps any sort of time limit during the course of this discussion, <laughs> if we're perfectly honest. <laughs> um, but yeah, okay, so now let's move on to outlining the scope of the Act. We were hoping to be able to get Dan Malin back on the show, um, but unfortunately he's not been well. Um, so I'll, I'll kick it off by explaining one of the sections that he wanted to draw attention to, and that is the emergency registration of health professionals. And you, will, you guys would have heard a lot about this. What it affects means is that it puts more nurses, doctors and so on who are in regulated areas of healthcare back on the ground, bringing them back into um, the stream. We spoke about this on episode one 
And practically what it means is that the doctors and nurses who have come out of retirement or maybe who are in the final stages of their training that, that normally wouldn't have been able to go into a hospital setting straight away have been allowed to go into those settings to ease the burden on the frontline staff who are dealing with the coronavirus pandemic. The likelihood is that they're not being put into the coronavirus wards, they're being put into the wards that they otherwise would have practiced. And then people who are used to being in day-to-day -day practice will move over towards the coronavirus areas. Um, affected areas. So from the statistics that we were hearing when this act was passed, that had meant that a possible 60,000 more nurses could be added to the pool, another 15 and a half thousand doctors being added, um, and there were reports of there being around 8,000 returning clinicians, um, and that was back in March. So the numbers would be massive in terms of who is coming forward, and we've definitely seen a spirit of togetherness and working really hard in terms of the NHS. So I'll lead, move over now to Tash to set out what has happened in terms of temporary registration of social workers. So the government has recognised the vital work that social workers do in society in order to protect um, people, work with families and protect children in particular, um, by introducing uh, provisions to allow for the temporary registration of social workers. Um, they can be temporarily registered um, when the Secretary states that there is, states that there is an emergency um, involving um, loss of human life or human illnesses and things like that. Um, social workers, just like doctors, uh, barristers and other professionals have to be registered and regulated uh, in order to practice. Um, their temporary registration will stop um, once the Secretary of State says the circumstances uh, no longer exist um, for the need of it, and um, either when the registration the registrar decides not, no longer to have them on the register. Um, in terms of how it's happened in practice, Social Work England have automatically placed previous social workers uh, on the temporary social wo uh, worker register, and that is those who've been uh, left uh, off the register or took themselves off the register in the last two years. Um, so it's a kind of opt-out process, um, and the register is online. Uh, in terms of Wales, it's more of an opt-in, people have to apply. Um, the individuals who are on the register are not obliged to practice, um, but it's, um, I'm assuming, um, creating a means for them to be able to quickly go out um, and apply for jobs should they need to. Great, thank you very much, Tash. Okay, we're going to move on to Susie now, who's going to outline what it says about emergency volunteers and changing to changes to the Employment Rights Act. Thank you, OJ. Um, so you'll recollect that the government had a massive drive to get people to sign up, to volunteer, to provide essential services and also to provide just general assistance. Um, essentially, the Coronavirus Act allows for the government to maximise that um, that pool of volunteers um, and fill the gaps in capacity um, for those essential services and takes away two deterrents um, in order to ensure that the volunteers can actually um, undertake the work. So first they recognise that the, em the employee might be at risk of losing their job and secondly they recognise the employee might be afraid to lose their income and so maybe disincentivized to actually volunteer. Um, so what the Coronavirus Act does is makes it mandatory for employers to release their employees to become a voluntary, um, uh, to become a volunteer rather, um, unless they are exempt for whatever reason and that's specified in the Act but as you can imagine it's um, really for services that are needed already um, rather than those that are not um, under the Act anyway. Um, so this isn't yet enforced, this is something that a minister can say at any time, um, they can order that it is uh, brought into force um, and essentially every single employee who meets the criteria under the Act would be released to provide um, emergency um, services under um, the emergency volunteer leave provisions. It's quite similar the way it sounds to going to jury duty, making sure that people have their um, place of work still available, their, their place at work still available to them after a 
performing a public function essentially is that right Susie? Yes that's right so essentially you are just released for that time and that time period can be two three or four consecutive weeks um, and during that time you are entitled to exactly the same terms and conditions of your employment the only terms and conditions that you don't have are your salary um, and that's only from the employer but there is um, a provision within the Act which allows uh, the Secretary of State to essentially pay your wages and so um, they provide um, a payment for your services um, for being a volunteer. Um, all the employee needs to do is give three working days notice before their first day of volunteer leave um, and they will still benefit from all the terms and conditions of their employment. They can't get dismissed as a consequence of it. Um, and the Secretary of State will give compensation to the employee. Great. So, Alistair, can you let us know what's happening in terms of statutory sick pay and national insurance contributions? Yeah, sure. So there's there's a, a chunk of uh, uh, provisions in the Act, which I think is just an example of how sweeping and wide ranging some of this is. Um, essentially drives a cart and horses through so normally some quite complicated provisions about pay and national insurance contributions. Um, so effectively sections 39 to 44 of the Act <clears throat> allow HMRC to um, pay employers, cover employers sick pay, statutory sick pay, um, if anyone's off sick with the coronavirus. Um, and it also removes the normal waiting period. So normally you have to wait three days before your statutory sick pay kicks in. But if you're off with coronavirus, that's taken out. Um, and then there's further sections later on in the Act, section 72 to 74, that massively simplify the usual procedure for changing national insurance contribution levels and thresholds, which means the government can just completely change um, how that's paid and whether they can compensate employers for it. And in fact, that's what they've done. So they've announced they'll cover national insurance contributions for some employers who are struggling to cope um, because of the lockdown provisions. Um, but I think the key thing to know is just that it's, it's giving huge powers to make regulation to the relative secretary of states. That's really interesting. I think what we're getting the picture of is just how wide reaching this act is. The fact that all of these provisions are in the same piece of legislation, I think, is, to use the colloquialism, wild. Um, so, Tom Lowell, we're going to go over to you for the provisions in relation to residential tenancies and business tenancies, please. Yeah, uh, similar to um, Aris, the, um, the, the provisions of the act, as far as it relates to um, my my um, area of practice is, has been quite fundamental. Um, the government were very quick to announce prior to the act that they were essentially uh, placing all evictions on uh, on halt, and effectively that's what they've done. So um, what the act does, it, uh, it prevents uh, landlords from bringing any court action uh, for a period of three months. So any statutory notices that have to be served. Uh, must um, be for a minimum of uh, three months um, and so therefore uh, landlords can't take any action whatsoever based on rental arrears or antisocial behaviour uh, against its tenants. So it essentially gives tenants um, a, a carte blanche to, uh, to breach um, their, uh, their tenancy obligations whilst um, stifling the landlord's ability to manage um, their housing stock. Um, the uh, other aspect to this case is that um, by way of secondary legislation, the uh, relevant um, Secretary of State can extend the period. Um, whilst this is, is not a feature of the Act, but these um, the further points are supplementary to the Act, um, two days after the Act uh, passed, there was uh, an addition to the relevant practice direction of the CPR, which essentially uh, says that there's going to be a stay of 90 days um, in respect of any uh, possession proceedings. So again, um, supplementing that which is contained within the Act, um, the CPR basically says no possession cases for a period of 90 days. That includes current um, um, cases and cases um, that landlords were uh, seeking to uh, bring before the courts. Um, in terms of business uh, leases, briefly, uh, the 
the the um, raison d'etre behind the, the Redwood provisions is to naturally uh, address the lack of footfall, cash flow, uh, and deliveries um, that the, um, the, the 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 social distancing measures have had. So, in short, uh, uh, business uh, landlords um, cannot um, end tenancies by way of forfeiture or reentry uh, for a period of three months. Um, that the act does not prevent forfeiture or re-entry uh, for any other breaches. Um, again, the accompanying guidance is quite clear that um, the government expect um, uh, landlords to work with their tenancies, uh, their tenants in, in these difficult times. That's um, that's it for me. Thanks, Tom. And then we move over to Fiona to set out the quite wide-ranging expansion of police powers. Yep, so in terms of um, initially court powers, um, what we're going to cover in, in due course is the pressure that's on the courts at the moment. And Section 22 of the Act basically gives the Secretary of State the ability to appoint temporary judges for up to six months at a time um, if, if there's a shortage because of coronavirus. But any appointment will come to an end when the regulations cease to have effects. So we're not just um, elevating up uh, a new um, swathe of judges. In terms of uh, fingerprints and DNA, usually if these are taken during an investigation and the person is not convicted, then they're destroyed after three years. Um, now there's a, a power to extend this for up to six months if it's in the interest of national security. Uh, and then the main act in terms of police powers is Schedule 21, which gives powers relating to potentially infectious people. Um, and this combined with the health protection regulations, which we're going to come on to, is one of the main areas of the act in terms of powers which restrict the movement of the public and ensure compliance with testing and treatment. Um, Schedule 21 gives mirrored powers for public health officers, police officers and immigration officers, where they have reasonable grounds to suspect that a person is a potentially infectious person, to direct them um, or in fact remove them to a place that's suitable for screening and assessment. And it also gives the power to require that person to remain at, at a location for screening and assessment for up to 48 hours, and then subsequently to impose requirements and restrictions on the person as is necessary and proportionate in the interests of either the person, the protection of others, or the maintenance of public health should that person in fact test positive, have an inconclusive test, or it be reasonably believed that they may have um, COVID-19. And that can include restrictions on their movements, their activities, and their contact with other people for a period of up to 14 days. So basically, if they suspect that you have the disease, even if you haven't actually tested positive for it, they can move you, make you go to somewhere else, and they can. there's various restrictions they can place on your person. And as you've said, that's also, we'll come back to similar provisions which are set out in the healthcare protection regulations. Yeah. Okay, so the next part is what's happening in terms of court and tribunals. I'm sure you guys are getting a flavour of it already, so I'll deal with this really quickly. Basically, there's been an expansion of the use of audio and video hearings to prevent people from having to physically attend court. But obviously, there's a restriction on the type of hearings that you can hear using that mechanism, because you need to bear in mind that people need to be physically present at court for certain hearings, that juries need to attend, which means you have 12 different people coming from different parts of the uh, city or their catchment area, sitting next to each other in quite close proximity and then going back to their various homes. So what's happened is the Act basically says or provides for certain types of hearing to be heard using video and audio. So things like appeals to the Magistrates Court in the Crown Court. So if you had a really straightforward trial in the Magistrates Court, if you don't like the outcome of it, you can appeal the sentence in the Crown Court using a video hearing. You could do the same with the actual full trial as well, if the full trial was heard via video in the Magistrates Court. But what you can't do, and this is really key, is you can't have a jury trial either by audio or by video hearing. So what we have seen as criminal practitioners is that all trials have come to a halt when they involve jurors um, and there's going to be a backlog in the system. 
and th that has a knock-on effect which we'll deal with later in terms of how many barristers chambers will actually still be around um, once those trials can be heard uh, but that's something to move on to okay so if we go back to Alistair now just to set out what's happening with inquests uh, so the other side of the jury system and let us know what's happening there and then we'll go into the healthcare protection regulations and then we'll go into the juicy part of the episode which will be the conversation in general chat. Oh, yeah, it was just a very quick point, Ajay, about um, the effect on inquest, which is very similar to the criminal courts. Um, any jury inquest, which is often some of the most interesting and complicated ones involving deaths and custody, use of police powers, that kind of thing, um, is, is not going to be happening. So the, the chief coroner, uh, the, the act allows um, uh, inquest with juries to be suspended. Um, the chief coroner has issued guidance um, saying that coroner's courts are just generally not to um, hear anything in person that's doing remotely, which in practice means that almost everything is being postponed. And in particular, that jury inquests aren't to start again until September. Um, so that's all been sort of pushed down the road. One other interesting thing though that's come out from the chief coroner is uh, just a reiteration of actually a fairly obvious point, which is that COVID-19 deaths don't necessarily need an inquest. Um, I think people, because it's a very unusual new disease causing chaos, everyone's thinking, oh, we need some investigation. But of course it is effectively a form of natural causes death. So actually in most cases, a COVID-19 death wouldn't lead to any investigation. And they've made that clear. And that's something that I know Tom coates Smythe wants to delve into later when we get into the general provisions. All right, so very quickly, if we go through the healthcare protection regulations, and the reason I say very quickly is we have three minutes before we get to eight o'clock. And at eight o'clock, as we've done each week, we're going to need to pause our discussions and wildly clap for frontline um, workers and volunteers. So, Fiona, I'm handing it over to you to stick to it's two minutes now. So you've got two minutes. <laughs> OK, so the um, health care protection regulations are the bit that's caused all the confusion that the sort of police saying you can't buy Easter eggs and that kind of thing. Basically, they're the regulations, which are the key regulations are six to eight, which are the regulations which restrict movement. So um, provide that during an emergency period, no one can leave the house without reasonable excuse. And then it lists what reasonable excuses may be. It also provides the restriction on gatherings in a public place of more than two people, unless you're from the same household or for specific um, exceptions. And it, it gives the police or community support officer such uh, the power to take action as is necessary to enforce the requirements and restrictions imposed by the regulations and it also includes the power for the police to uh, fine on the spot if the officer reasonably believes that a, an individual has committed an offence under the regulations and is over the age of 18 so not a child. Nicely done Fiona. Susie we're going to come to you after eight. Is it eight now or is it 7.59? What time do you guys make it? Eight o'clock. Oh, make eight. Okay. Nine, but we can clap. <laughs> All right. <laughs> we, let's do it now. It's the spirit of it, isn't it? Even if we're a minute early, it's fine. Okay. So we'll do our clap. Woo! Yay! Brilliant. I always say each week, I think my neighbours must think I'm really unsupportive because I never actually go to my door. I just clap here while I'm recording. But. Yeah, I you and me support. both, OJ. Yeah, I know. We do support them. We do support them. Yeah. Um, <laughs> all right. So, Susie, we're going to jump to you because those same healthcare protection regulations um, also tell us about which businesses are, are meant to shut, don't they? And about things like places of worship. So they have an impact in terms of employment law again. Yes, they're all pretty obvious. Um, it's the sort of um, businesses that you'd expect could cause harm if they continue to operate. So without going into great detail, but to give you a general overview, um, as you can imagine, restaurants and pubs, um, canteens, those sorts of things. If you're congregating en masse and eating, um, it's not very good for the spread of the coronavirus. So uh, naturally those are closed, save where, for example, they're in an NHS trust or in a prison um, and so are vital to the operation of that organisation. Um, the same is said for um, places of worship. They are now closed as well. 
um, save that they are allowed to be of a woman called Marie Deneau. Um, and I know that Fiona wants to discuss that and to highlight that. And we're opening up to general chat now across the um, panel. So Fee, could you take it away initially? Yeah, absolutely. So um, Marie Deneau was one of the first people to be convicted under the Act. Um, in summary, she was observed by police officers at Newcastle Police at uh, Newcastle train station, and she refused to give her name or her reasons for travel. She was arrested and charged under Schedule 21 of the Coronavirus Act, uh, and she was in fact convicted at her first appearance. Why that matters, normally um, at a first appearance, what happens is it's really an administrative hearing and the case would be adjourned to be set down for trial for you to get legal advice if you wanted it and also to review the evidence against you. Um, instead, what happened was she was not permitted in the court. She was sent back down to the cells because she failed to identify herself in court. She was not legally represented and no evidence was called. The uh, district judge convicted her on the papers, which is essentially the police officer's statements. Um, so she was convicted of an offence and fined £660. To understand what went wrong with this, we need to um, look at what actually the, the provisions under Schedule 21 provide, because she was convicted of an offence that doesn't exist. Um, Schedule 21 provides that anyone who fails without reasonable excuse to comply with the instructions or restrictions imposed by that schedule, or who gives false information, or who obstructs the exercise of those powers commits an offence punishable with a fine. So the problem is that refusing to give your name or reason for travel is not actually one of the instructions or restrictions under Schedule 21. The second problem is that Schedule 21 only actually relates to a potentially infectious person. What is that? Well, it's defined as uh, someone is potentially infectious if at any time they are or may be infected or contaminated with coronavirus and there's a risk that that person might infect or contaminate others or the person has been in an infected area within the 14 days preceding that time. And that's essentially an infected area is anywhere outside the UK where there's a high risk um, of transmission of coronavirus. So essentially she was convicted of, of an offence um, that didn't exist uh, under a, a schedule that wouldn't have applied to her anyway. Probably what the police thought they were trying to apply was the healthcare protection regulations in, in respect of being outside of your home without a reasonable excuse. But it really highlights the lack of understanding on the part of the police and more worryingly the CPS and the judge who convicted her, which all ultimately led to the error being made. And, and that's always the risk with any sort of hastily passed legislation. How it all came to light, um, essentially uh, a member of the press took interest in the case because it was the, the first conviction and looked into it and the matter gained traction on Twitter and Krusty Brownlow QC became involved uh, and realised that in fact the offence that um, Mr New had been convicted of didn't in fact exist. There was a big awareness campaign then taken up by the press and ultimately what happened was the conviction was quashed and the CPS aren't pursuing any other charges. The worrying thing about this, one of the big knock-on effects of coronavirus on the court system is access for the press to legal proceedings because so much has been done now by phone or by, for example, video link. It's really difficult for members of the press to gain access to what's going on. And you have to wonder, had a member of the press not picked up on this, it, it gained this traction um, on, for instance, social media and within the press. Would anyone have noticed or, or would this poor woman be sat with conviction for an offence that didn't in fact exist at all? Well, it was really interesting, wasn't it? Because she didn't say a word. That was actually the, the one thing that I found so, so shocking about this. She didn't say a single thing. So it wasn't even just that she didn't give her name. She, it's not that she refused to give her name. She just didn't speak. She didn't speak in court. She didn't speak when she was arrested. So this woman just went through the entire system from arrest to conviction without saying a single thing. And on that day, and basically by staying quiet she got convicted as well as you know being at the train station but I just found it really shocking because like you say Fee, she didn't have any representation and that highlights another underlying issue that we have with the system at the moment because she ought to have had a duty solicitor uh, present with her so that raises questions as well it's a first appearance so to everyone who is 
um, tuning in who, who's not working in the criminal justice system in any way, a first appearance, all court hearings um, in crime start with an admin hearing in the magistrate's court. They normally take about 5, 10, 15 minutes, if that, especially if you're entering a not guilty plea and just sending it up rather than being sentenced. And so the fact that rather than that just being this admin hearing, you had the woman who wasn't represented, who I understand was also good character, so not somebody who'd had any interaction with the courts either, all of a sudden just being put in this position where everything is being decided on the papers for something that ultimately didn't exist in the first place. Uh, um, and something else that you touched on, Fee, and I'm just going to throw this one out there, in terms of experiences that you guys have had with attending court virtually, is that it's, it's really in the baby stages and so the, the two court hearings that I've had which have been virtual have been 10 minute long hearings and I it's taken 40 to 40, to an, 40 minutes to an hour before we can even get through to the court so that's us as barristers who have access to the whole system who are aware that the hearing is happening who've got our ducks in a row got ready and so on it takes us that long to access a hearing in the first place I don't understand how it is that members of the public the, the press and so on are supposed to participate in these proceedings at all. So what experiences have you guys had? Have you had, have you had it running smoothly? <laughs> Tom Coates, mine. Um, my... Are you frozen? My experience actually was that it, it was, oh, yeah. but this week I've had um, some smoother hearings and I've had a, a video link where I've been on video link. Um, and actually I've had the strange experience of seeing a judge in his full robe sat on a bench in the Crown Court, um, which was presumably open, um, and have a court clerk read out the case, which made me think that it must still be open to the public if they wanted to go in there. Now, in reality, um, I can't imagine um, to see that. So it, it does, from concern of the Crown Court I appeared in, it does seem like um, that they are making efforts to let the public attend. So, so they seem to have improved since the first hearing I did. Well, that's good in terms of uh, that. In terms of practicalities, though, for the future, I'm not sure how sustainable that would be. Um, just the risk of, of the fact that things will spread. But it's also the, the, whether the public is even willing to take that step of going to court. The point of having the, the public and members of the press uh, present to court is that, like uh, Fiona was indicating, they help to hold the system accountable. Um, Tom, did you have your hand up as well? Tom? Yeah, yeah. I, from from a, um, a family uh, perspective, I think Natasha may be able to assist with this. Um, the, the the first wave of guidance we received um, was look at all of these great experiences from New Zealand, from the High Court, of um, complicated cases uh, being dealt with uh, remotely. Um, and there was a, a report from a particular High Court judge who set out in detail um, how the difficulties could uh, uh, be overcome. Um, and then what we saw, um, particularly in Birmingham, is with the best one in the world, it's very challenging to get, for example, a vulnerable uh, mother or father who um, may not have access to uh, uh, iPad or iPhone or laptop to engage in even the most straightforward of hearings, for example, directions hearing. Um, and so we found that there were a number of people who couldn't physically access justice. Um, and then there was, there was further guidance published by the various um, uh, uh, relevant judges and subsequently, um, the president of the Family Law Division has announced there's going to be a review, uh, a two week uh, review where he's inviting people to um, 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 contribute to their experience, uh, with their experiences of whether or not uh, the remote uh, hearings have been fair, what difficulties they, they, they faced. Um, and so I think, it, dealing with the most vulnerable people in society, be it court of protection work or family work, and uh, um, to, to an extent, those who find themselves before the criminal courts is proving a real challenge. Yeah, I've got, I've got a case that involves CCTV, for example, and I have a client who's self-isolating. I don't know how my solicitor is meant to show my client the CCTV 
because he doesn't have a laptop. So, and he, no one has a DVD player anymore. So she literally was asked, she was like, how am I supposed to send this home to him without risking, also without risking the evidence being disseminated? If she puts it onto an online system, then you've got all the GDPR restrictions and so on. So it's going to be interesting to see how those workings um, work out. Tash? Um, I just wanted to add to it, um, particularly from a um, family perspective, and it might apply to crime as well. Um, there are other difficulties that can come with remote hearings, um, such as the need for interpreters. Uh, and also the need for intermediaries to assist parties to participate in proceedings. Um, those are issues that have been, I think, acknowledged by the president of the family division. Um, and he's hopefully going to be looking at ways to um, try and make it easier. I myself had um, a client um, who needed an interpreter last week. We had a telephone hearing. Um, the way we resolved it was we had the interpreter, but the interpreter interpreted on the same line, which meant that a hearing which could have taken, let's say half an hour, ended up taking an hour um, because we had to work, stop and wait every point for the person to be interpreted. And then also me trying to take instructions um, in between the hearing was a bit um, tricky, having to try and get everybody in line and arranged and ready to have a, a separate telephone conference for, for those sorts of things. And just so that for people listening, an intermediary is somebody who is appointed by the court to assist particularly vulnerable defendants who may have issues with communication or understanding. What they're supposed to do is they're meant to watch the defendant and see if they're having any sort of problem and then intervene. Um, or they uh, have an assessment with the client and they propose a form of the way that questions are supposed to be put and so on. So how that would work over a virtual setting, particularly if the intermediary can't be next to the defendant let alone being separate from everybody else in the courtroom I don't know how that's going to work and either and um, Alistair and Fiona you guys had your hands up so I'll go to you afterwards but I think Tash has an explanation to come to about intermediaries so we'll go over to you guys Tash Sorry. Um, yes, no, I was going to say that that is a particular problem, um, especially given the fact that the uh, intermediary um, should be able to be there to be able to um, seek um, to the party, because we use them for uh, mainly parents and care proceedings, um, to be able to work out whether um, we need to take breaks, um, because often people need um, lots of breaks um, during proceedings, um, and being able to alert the judge of those sorts of things. So it, it's quite difficult. Um, another point I wanted to raise is unlike um, crime and family proceedings, we are having some cases um, where there are long final hearings and fact finding hearings um, actually taking place virtually. Um, although it is a bit of a mix uh, between the different court centers uh, and there are difficulties that can come in with that. Um, one of them being, for example, and it's been acknowledged that it is um, difficult for people, um, lay parties as well as advocates to sit in front of a screen for an entire day um, doing and conducting a hearing or listening to a hearing. And there was an interesting article by the Transparency Project, was, which was looking at the effect that um, it can have on um, lay parties and um, the negative effect that they can have on having to um, have remote hearings and not being there um, face to face with people. Yeah, and I imagine in a highly charged situation like family law, that's, that's particularly important. Um, Susie, I think actually prior to V and to Al, you'd indicated that you wanted to say something. So if we go over to Susie, then we'll go over to Al, then we'll go over to Fiona. Um, so in the employment tribunals, all in-person in hearings have been converted to case management hearings um, on the telephone. Um, in Telephone hearings are pretty standard in the employment tribunal anyway for case management uh, directions. So that's nothing new and that's been pretty straightforward as I understand it. But it does mean that most in-person hearings have been completely abandoned um, for the time being and then will take place um, essentially in accordance with the directions. So what those case management directions um, are doing are specifying when the actual eventual hearing will take place and how it will happen. Um, theoretically, it could happen virtually, um, though I don't know any cases personally that have taken place virtually or have been scheduled to take place virtually. I don't know what Alistair's um, experience is in that sense, but um, it's just an interesting time. And I think out of all the tribunals, the employment tribunal are really well equipped to deal with it because we do have people appearing via video link anyway in certain hearings. So um, only time will tell, but 
unless the uh, judge directs otherwise, all in-person hearings are um, basically vacated and turned into a case management hearing. Okay, if we go over to Al and then we'll go over to Fiona. Yeah, my just on the employment question, my experience so far has been the same as um, Suzanne's because um, I think basically my experience so far has been like five hearings have all been just sort of booted down the road. We've had a case management discussion and then they've just been postponed. So nothing, they haven't, they haven't attempted to do anything in, tri in the employment tribunal by video link, which is surprising. Um, as you say, it's reasonably well set up for it. So even there, they're sort of punting stuff down the park. Um, the, the point I was going to make was just bouncing off what a lot of people have been raising about the, the practical problems and logistical problems for litigants, for actual parties in a lot of um, court hearings being made virtual or remote. The, the other thing I was going to raise was just that actually the emotional problem and cost of it, which applies across the board, I think, but a, a colleague of mine who works in the court of protection pointed me to a really moving blog post that had been written by a um, a party to a court of protection. In fact, it was the it was the person supporting someone um, who was the subject of court of protection proceedings who didn't have mental capacity. Um, and they were just explaining how they had a virtual hearing, a video hearing, which um, the lawyers all thought worked really well. So they were all very impressed and thought it had all been very slick and the technology had worked and they managed to get through the hearing and it had all been very good. And the actual party to it was devastated because this had been a really important thing for them. They were waiting for their time to have a judge and feel dignified and a real sense of justice and the importance of this moment. And instead they were sitting at a computer screen with a whole bunch of people talking really technical language that they didn't understand. And they didn't even have that sense of, I've gone to court and people are taking this really seriously. So it's worth even thinking about those kind of more sort of human emotional aspects to this whole situation. That's so true. That's so true. And I, I think that's definitely, that's the feeling that I have with criminal cases as well, that these things may work well for us as lawyers, but we're really reducing the amount of participation that defendants and complainants and victims, witnesses and so on can have in the system. And the whole point of the court system is that people feel, even regardless of the result, they feel that they've had a fair hearing. They feel that they've had the opportunity to participate. It's not dependent on the outcome. It's, it's, it's the process that needs to be seen to be doing justice and seen to be um, fair, which has uh, concerns. Um, I just wondered, Tash or Ali, could you guys just like, just outline what the court of protection does. So it's a phrase that we're used to hearing as lawyers, but I don't think the average person is aware of what the court of protection's role is. You're both on mute. <laughs> I'll go, go for, okay. you go for okay. it. <laughs> go on, Tasha. <laughs> Sorry, yeah, the um, Court of uh, Protection deals with um, cases involving um, things such as the welfare of people, particularly those who um, lack capacity and, and, and things like that. So basically it's people who may have quite severe or, or maybe less severe than had been appreciated uh, mental health issues. So people who have this, this kind of, their sense of personhood already has been undermined to an extent before they've even gone through the process, let alone them then getting to the hearing and not being able to participate. I can imagine that's a bit of a double whammy for them mm. um, in terms of those sorts of matters. OK, so if we just go back to Fiona, because I know that you wanted to highlight the other side of things. So we obviously are dealing with um, defendants, we're dealing with witnesses, but we forget sometimes, I think, that defendants are in custody. And so if they're in custody and this is happening, what's happening in prisons? If there are delays with trials, what's the situation in terms of prisons and prisoners? So um, the position is that despite the best efforts of the court system to try and keep things on track, and initially um, prior to the, the stricter lockdown, some trials did carry on, but with social distancing where you had, for instance, jurors sat in a press box, or I heard about a colleague even had jurors sat up on the judge's bench. Um, but the reality is it's just not possible. You can't expect jurors to focus on the evidence um, in a a scenario such as this and the so defendants wouldn't have a fair trial either if you have the juror who's sitting there worried that they're about to contract coronavirus they're going to rush their decisions they're not going to listen to the evidence properly it's unfair on defendants as well as on the victims and witnesses too 
Exactly. And so what's ended up happening is that trials are being kicked into the long grass effectively. Um, I've had mixed experiences. I've had some courts that are willing to try and refix trials for the summer, some where they will just not fix a new date because they, they don't, we don't know when lockdown is going to end. Um, and this really has the, the effect um, Positive and negative, depending on how you look at it. If you are someone who narrowly missed out on bail, now is your time to apply for bail because um, there is certainly more bail being granted because the unique circumstances we find ourselves in. Similarly, if you are someone who is going to be sentenced and you might be on the cusp of a custodial sentence, there's definitely a push towards what's called a suspended sentence where the period of imprisonment um, isn't actually activated provided you comply with certain requirements. Um, but the problem is if you are in custody waiting for a trial, you now don't know when that trial is going to take place. Uh, and the reality is, is that we, uh, the prisons are sitting ducks. You have a, a large population. The UK is one of the largest prison populations in Europe, if not the largest, um, a large prison population in close confines. Um, prison visits are cancelled. Uh, so they're not getting to see members of their family. They're barely getting to, sit, to have any contact with their lawyers. They're being locked down for um, essentially the whole day or, or as much of the day as is possible to try and prevent the spread. And there's only so much you can do because you have prison officers coming in and out of the prison and inevitably that carries some risk with it. Uh, and so it's a really hard time right now to be in prison, whether you are waiting for trial or in fact a serving prisoner and there, there is a massive risk there it's a bit like the risk with care homes that when you have a population in such close proximity if someone gets coronavirus it's going to move through the population pretty quickly i also just wanted to say at this point um because we're doing the clap for the nhs every thursday and so on and one area that i don't think is getting enough attention is the court staff the, and the prison staff who are keeping this the justice system going right now um, and also all the barristers as well and I think they should all be given a shout out because a lot of those staff are going to work in really really difficult circumstances and doing the best that they can in an impossible situation and you know the justice system never gets any real recognition so I think we should give them that recognition um, but in terms of when trials are going to be restarting it's anyone's guess. Yeah, and it's, it's just not, like you say, it's not uniform either in terms of the response. So I know some Crown Courts where all that we're doing is setting another date for directions hearing. And then other Crown Courts where, like you say, they are setting down trial dates. And though the old Bailey is trying to make sure that really serious, quite heinous murder cases are heard in July, how realistic that will be, I don't know. Um, Tom Lowell, I know that you wanted to speak about stuff from a housing perspective, but Tom Coates-Miller, did you have something to say there about criminal cases? You had your hand up. Just on the criminal, just to jump in, I mean, I think one of the, the big problems very quickly is um, that there's just a lack of strategic direction on which cases ought to be prioritised, which cases ought to be heard. Uh, and, and for me, one thing I'd really like to see is I'd like to see members of the senior judiciary really getting a grip of this and saying, right, this is going to be your approach to listing. These are going to be the priorities. These are going to be the cases. Uh, and, and what's been very frustrating in my experience is a total lack at the moment um, of, of that trickle down, um, because courts, it seems to me, need to start planning ahead if we're going to hit the custody time limits, which are six months. People have to be tried within six months of um, being monitored in custody. So, so that's, I think that's my big frustration, but hopefully as position gets clearer that that will change, but I think that's what's been lacking at the moment. Tom Lewell, how has things been from the housing law perspective, yeah. that's the other facet of your experience? Yeah, um, I think, I think the, the, the great debate that we're having here is the, the, the debate between the impact on civil liberties and obviously the protection of the, of the individual. And from a housing point of view, what the government have done, they've said, well, look, we're going to pause um, all evictions effectively uh, for a period of three months. That is, on any view, a good thing, because um, it would be contra contrary to all of our interests to have uh, people um, uh, uh, essentially kicked out on, on the streets, particularly in this, in this time. And it would seem to be a, an extremely cruel thing to do. 
Um, so, so when it comes to protect the protection of rights, for example, Article 8, right to private family life, it's clear that the government in the context of housing uh, law is doing the right thing. But then there is the, the other side, because ultimately uh, a, a private landlord, a social landlord can't exercise their housing management functions and can't look to uh, uh, take uh, their property back. And so if you have a tenant, for example, who is causing significant antisocial behavior, and you want to try to stop that antisocial behavior by obtaining a possession order, you can't. If you have a tenant who is unable to pay their rent, for example, due to uh, uh, losing their job, um, but you have a social landlord or you have a local authority or you have a private landlord who relies on uh, rental income in order to exist, then there is a difficulty there. Now, what the government have attempted to do is to say, well, look, we're pausing, uh, in effect, possession proceedings for a period of three months, but you still have other avenues. So, for example, the uh, social landlord, if he has a tenant who is um, misbehaving, can seek injunctive relief. I mean, there's a whole host of difficulties that practitioners have experienced. Um, um, but what, what is injunctive relief? Just uh, for so, 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 so um, this is for social landlord, not, not a private landlord. So if, if a, a, a landlord has a tenant that is um, engaging in antisocial behaviour, the uh, landlord um, can uh, bring a tenancy enforcement action by going to the court and saying, look, we need an injunction to stop this person from engaging in antisocial behaviour. And we've seen in the news that certain landlords have used um, that power uh, and have brought matters before the court to stop people from having wild parties. So that is a tool. But, then, but what happens, sorry Tom, what happens then if they get that, that person doesn't comply with the injunction? Yeah. How is that enforced? Yeah, that's a really I interesting point because what the, the courts have said, so from um, the, the civil courts, from the 1st of April, the courts have said, well, there are certain cases which are, uh, which must be heard and certain cases which may be heard. So the cases that must be heard are cases where um, landlords seek um, an injunction, and if somebody breaches the injun that injunction, uh, those proceedings are known as committal proceedings, the court will hear those cases. So um, in, in one scenario, a landlord who can't obtain a possession order because of the, the stay in possession proceedings and because of um, the, the relevant provisions of the Coronavirus Act could, in theory, go to court and seek an injunction. If that injunction is breached, the court can invite, the, the landlord can invite the court to um, commit the tenant to prison. So the effect of preventing uh, possession proceedings is likely, it, um, could uh, uh, lead to more landlords going down the injunction route and having people potentially being the subject of um, uh, custodial sentences. And so where the, um, the, the housing landscape attempts to strike a balance in one respect, it may be argued that in a different respect, it's, it's creating um, more of a problem. Interesting. I, had, I was completely unaware of that. It's, it's quite fascinating, I think, that when you practice in one area, just have a little crossover with um, other areas of law. I had no idea about that um, whatsoever. Um, Natasha, we wanted to talk to you about um, the rise that we've seen in terms of domestic violence cases. One of the repercussions that we've had, this doesn't flow directly from um, the act, but it does come from the stay at home guidance. And then as we see in the regulations, the fact that if you are outside without a reasonable excuse, you can be subject to uh, being charged with an offence. So if we then look at that, one of the concerns is, of course, people are at home. And if you don't have a safe home environment, then there has been, hasn't there, a rise in domestic violence incidents, is that right? Um, yes, there has been. Um, there's certainly been reports of um, domestic abuse charities receiving a, a larger number of uh, inquiries and um, logons into their websites. Um, I've read that Refuge uh, reported a 700% increase in calls to its hotline in a single day. Um, so it's um, getting particularly um, concerning for people. Um, one thing that I find quite frustrating is that this was predictable. 
Um, it was something that common sense would tell you is something that's going to happen. And it's also something that we had seen in other countries, um, such as in China, um, where they um, had lockdown before we did. And I would have hoped that the government would have um, put more in uh, resources into charities and, and other organisations to try and help it. Um, we see it in the UK every year, don't we? Because, I mean, and we see it in crime as well. So around Christmas time, there's always a spike in domestic violence cases, even a spike in homicidal cases involving domestic settings, because families are spending more intense periods uh, together. And if you're a dysfunctional family unit, then crime within your household is going to go up. So like you say, it was completely predictable. Um, sorry, it's across, kind of across no, you. That, no, that's fine, it is completely predictable. Um, so the government has responded though, um, last weekend, um, some of you may have tuned in to watch the um, Home Secretary uh, deliver the daily briefing. Um, and she has um, stated that they will launch a public awareness campaign um, under the hashtag You Are Not Alone. Uh, it has the aim to reassure those affected by domestic abuse that support services remain available. Um, uh, and they are encouraging the general public to show their solidarity and support. Um, by putting up a photo of a heart on their palm to show victims that they are not alone and to convey to perpetrators that domestic abuse is unacceptable in any circumstance. Um, that's then, really going to help. That's really going to help. I, I'm very really, really, really how, that's a great strategy. I can't see how a heart on a palm, if I just drew one right now, I really don't see how that can stop a, a perpetrator from committing domestic abuse. I, I really the, fact that, the fact that Priti Patel said that with a straight face as mm. well, when she announced it, like she should have won an Oscar. Like I, I couldn't believe that that was an actual announcement. She took a time to walk over to the podium. And the way that she, the build up to it as well, was just like, yeah, we really, you know, we really want everyone to feel like they're properly supported. And she was smiling and then she, oh, I was just like, are you mad? OJ, no. OJ, you said, OJ, you said something that isn't strictly speaking true. You said that she said it with a straight face. She, she's <laughs> never seen her with a straight face. <laughs> Oh, I have so much to say. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think that, that is so true. Uh, but I have been thinking about this campaign and I've been thinking, why has it particularly frustrated me? And I don't necessarily think it's the campaign itself. I think if the campaign had come from a charity, for example, and we were to be asked to, to you know, draw the heart on the palm and you know, put that on social media and on windows and stuff to show solidarity and to raise awareness, I think that's acceptable. But coming from the government, which should be um, doing more to stop perpetrators from committing these offences and also to protect um, people, uh, victims and their children um, from witnessing and being part of it, um, is what they should be doing. They shouldn't have sat down and spent all that time thinking, what colour should we use for the logo and where should the heart go and all that sort of stuff. It, their energy should have been used elsewhere, in my opinion. I completely agree. And I know that Ali had his hands up and so did Fiona. Yeah, I was just going to say, I think probably the far more useful thing, which hopefully might make a difference, is the big um, injection of funding to the charitable sector, which was announced by the Chancellor Rishi Sunak last week, I think. Um, now, I don't know how much of that's actually coming through, but I know some of the charities that were being highlighted as supposedly getting them that funding were those dealing with um, abuse um, and that kind of thing. So I see Tash has got a response, so there might be more... Uh I'll go to Tash in a second. I'll go to Tash in a second. But, but this is not stuff that should be dealt with by charities. Like if you have charities dealing with fundamental issues pertaining to rights and safety, that shows a lack in welfare that ought to be met by the government. The fact that they're like, even the fact that it's that it's charities that need to be the people, the, 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 the safety net for you, for you to feel safe at home. That is ridiculous. I think that's ridiculous. Sorry, Tash, what were you going to say? No, that's fine. I mean, I completely agree with what you were saying. And um, to be fair to the government, there are two points that I should raise that they've done. One is they're providing two million to bolster the domestic abuse um, helplines and online support. Uh, and then also there is the 750 million um, to support charities. But that is charities generally. I understand that charities actually have to bid for them. The government is encouraging um, domestic abuse charities to bid for it. But they're going to be fighting with so many other different charities who are trying to um, gain access to that money. So we don't know how much is actually 
going to end up going to these domestic abuse charities. But like um, Abby has said, I think the government should be doing, should have the responsibility and accept the responsibility and actually being the ones to do something to stop this. Yeah, Fee, you had your hand up. And then we're going to go over to Tom, because I know that Tom Coates and I have had some stuff that he wanted to raise in relation to coroner's inquest. We'll go over to that after. It's just to say, really, the, the idea of the, the heart on the palm it is so symptomatic of the problem with this government and its response, because it, it's a bit like the clap for the NHS on a Thursday, or now let's not forget Matt Hancock's care badge. And um, the fact that we are allowing or, or needing a charity to fund the NHS, and now we're needing um, charities to fund domestic violence services, that we're doing these symbols of support for the NHS, support for domestic violence, violence um, victims. Instead of having these symbols, fund things properly. That's your job as the government. Do not rely on the public and their charitable nature to fund basic services that you should be funding. So yeah, I I, clap. <laughs> <laughs> this is the ranty episode, guys, by the way. We started off with the kind of like the very straight laced discussion about legislation, but now we're getting passionate. As we get passionate, Tom Coates Live is going to come through and talk about Article 2 um, and inquests. I am. Oh, Tom, it's frozen again. One second. Yeah, I'm um, sorry, sir. Hello. All right. So, Tom, for some reason, whenever you talk, it freezes. OK, I'm, I'm going to try again. And, OK, go. Right. I, I was going to talk about um, coronavirus and inquests, which was touched upon earlier by Alistair, because I think for me, one of the most fascinating things about what's going on is what's going to come next, because clearly. Clearly, thousands of people are. The question, it seems to me, is is what's going to happen when, when this comes to an end? What's the um, inquiry going to be? Is there going to be an inquest to every death? Is there going to be an inquiry? Um, and as Alistair touched on earlier, the um, Coronavirus Act has removed, essentially, the requirement to hold uh, an inquest into a death from coronavirus, um, which on the face of it, It sounds very sensible context and that context is that before the coronavirus act um, if somebody died from an infectious disease like for example SARS um, or um, for example cholera an inquest would have to be held as a matter of law with a jury and the purpose of that which is what's so important is the inquest is there um, to prevent future death to find out how someone's done um, people or the state to account. So what I find very interesting is that by removing the automatic presumption of an inquest in cases of infection, um, what's going to happen when we start dealing with these cases where um, it looks, and there's certainly reports in the media, but it looks like, for example, there may have been deaths of doctors or of nurses uh, in hospitals because of lack of um, PPE. Uh, it's possible there have been deaths of prisoners um, in prisons because they may have been cohorted together when they've showed the same symptoms. Um, and for me, um, as a lawyer, but I'm sure for members of the public, um, I have the question of what is going to happen post the virus? How are we going to hold the government to account? Uh, and um, what's going to happen? Is it going to be English issues? Are there going to be public inquiries? So for me, I think there's a very real question about how Article 2, the right to life um, of the European Convention of Human Rights, how is that going to be applied when we look at what's happened? Yeah, and actually, just to chime in on that point, um, a case that comes to mind which reflects the points you've made very clearly, Tom, is the case of the Ghanaian nurse um, who um, passed away on the weekend, 20-year-old nurse who was in her ninth month of pregnancy and somehow still on a ward working um, and the question arises, how did that how did that happen when I'm not a doctor, but I understand from reading the story that 27 months in, as a pregnant doctor, as a, as a pregnant um, me member of medical staff, you shouldn't be working on, on a ward or, or a COVID ward for that matter. So if you can't have an inquest for maybe for that, then what about for other other elements? So for or, or other cases where where you, you sh understandably should have 
should should have some sort of inquest as to why that person got into a situation where they were infected or that, and died. So yeah, just to chime in on that point. Yeah, that's true. That that nurse as well wasn't she? I'm trying to remember. Wasn't she on maternity leave and she came back to work, or was it that I I can't remember the details of that. So I've only seen the first couple of sec- what was happening? let me have a look at it rather than just rambling on the podcast about it but I I thought that was particularly shocking because I f- think that she had maybe returned to work as well specifically because of what was happening um despite being in one of the vulnerable groups and Tom's completely right it, it's quite scary to think that that may not be something that triggers a jury involved coroner's in- inquest yeah go on Tom so, so just going back to that point, uh, what, what it's all going to turn on legally is whether um, it, the death is classified as being from natural causes. Um, and, and for lawyers, that's quite a tricky issue because um, the case law previously basically says um, that if there is an issue of culpable failing, um, potentially by an individual or, or significantly by the state, um, then that can mean that an otherwise natural death becomes unnatural um, on the face of it. And that can lead to a requirement for an inquest. So um, it's going to be really interesting to see how coroners deal with this. Um, and it's going to be, um, I think, very tricky because um, we can all think of examples where on the face of it, um, we're, we're reading reports in the press of people potentially catching coronavirus in circumstances where on the face of it, it it looks like they may not have been given the protection um, that they need. Um, And and so I think it's a legal issue, which I think is going to expand. Yeah, so just just going back to that specific case about the nurse, just to make sure that we're not kind of uh, moving from a wrong factual basis. So her last shift was actually on the 12th of March. Um, from what I can see and it's not known if she was infected while she was still at work um, or if she got it while she was off work but you know I think it's quite 12th of March to me still seems quite late in terms of continuing to to work Um, but it says that she wasn't working she wasn't treating coronavirus patients at the time but nonetheless it's it's a high-risk environment for somebody to be in when they're of one of the vulnerable categories Fiona I think you had your hand up yeah, I just wanted to ask a question really for uh, Tom and for you in terms of um, moving beyond sort of individual deaths and the inquest level to when this is all over in terms of do you think there is going to be an inquiry? Um, and if so, is that going to be one big umbrella inquiry dealing with different strands or lots of different smaller inquiries? Because we've got things like the lack of PPE equipment, the lack of ventilators, but then we also have the problematic policy decisions and the lack of care in terms of, for example, prisons, care homes um, and the like. And I'd just be interested for your views on that. So, um, Fiona, perhaps I'll I'll sort of have a go at that. I think that's going to be an incredibly difficult question um, to answer because um, legally, Article 2, the right to life, um, imposes an obligation on the state to hold an independent investigation into deaths where there is an arguable breach um, of the state's duties to protect life. So we could argue that we've got that here all over the place. Um, I think the problem is going to be political because I cannot imagine that this government um, is going to want to have a big public inquiry, looking at all of its failings, drawing them out in excruciating detail, um, which is why I think that there could be a groundswell of cases through inquests, through individual cases, uh, which starts to shine the spotlight, which could then trigger in due course a public inquiry. But I I don't think a public inquiry is going to happen anytime soon because that would need the government to agree to it. Yeah, I think I think if it does happen, it will happen in in a few years time, but I think it will happen. Um, especially if we have a change of government. So if we have a a different party that's in power, as we've seen previously with things like the infected blood inquiry and so on, um, with uh, Mid Staffordshire NHS inquiry, with Hillsborough and so on, once you move past the political question of that particular decision maker being in power, then the public interest in having the inquiry, it's much easier for the following government to, to make a case for it. But like you say, Tom, I think what needs to happen and very often what happens with all 
all of these inquiries is the groundswell of movement from people demanding answers to specific questions. And then as soon as that happens, the people in power have to listen. And um, as to whether or not it'll be one inquiry or lots of little ones, I can see I can see various scenarios. When you look at the public inquiries that we have at the moment, so for example, Grenfell. Well, I've definitely noticed, I don't know if you agree, Tom, is that I think that the scope of inquiries are just getting wider and wider. So you have these mammoth reports which are being released, which cover a huge range of factors. Uh, so, you know, you have Grenfell, which is dealing with the aftermath, it's dealing with construction, it's dealing with all sorts of areas. The number of experts that you have coming into um, these reports are amazing. And the sub teams themselves are often the size of a team that you'd normally have doing one inquest at all, so up to inquiry at all. So I, I could see there being an inquiry, it could be absolutely massive, and it, it could take years though. I don't see it happening within the next what five years i reckon it'll be post that but sometimes that's an advantage because you have a much clearer idea of the of the ramifications of things if you hold a public in inquiry too soon too close to the events you're still dealing with the ramifications of things you need to get back to some sort of normality before so that you can hold those powers accountable um susie did you have something to say i think you've had your hand up a couple of times but i've missed you sorry don't worry everything that i would have said someone else said so it's <laughs> Sorry, barristers loving the sounds of our own voices, as always. Um, right, let me go back to our plan for the episode and make sure that I'm still sticking to some sort of structure. Um, all right, so we've dealt with inquests. So we've, we've touched upon inquests, we've touched upon housing, we've touched upon family. Um, but there's still um, teething problems, aren't there, in relation to employment? So I know that we've separately done an episode on um, microeconomics where we dealt with, to some extent, um, the provisions which have been put out there for employment but as Raj was saying on that episode one of the problems that we had is that it was very new um, at that time it still is new but what have you guys experienced in terms of so not not the system so uh, uh, the court system so much but what have you guys experienced in terms of how it's actually working out how, how are these furlough payments being paid out are they being paid out are businesses being efficient is it clear are they applying for the right things are they getting to the people that they're supposed to we all loved Rishi when he made the announcements but what's actually happening on the ground um Shall I just give a couple of sort of overview points yeah. and then um, maybe Susie can chip in with a bit more of the detail or bounce off what I say if you disagree. Um, <clears throat> I think the, the, the extraordinary thing is that potentially the numbers seem to suggest that up to 25% of the British workforce might be furloughed at some point. So we're going to have this situation where the government is going to be paying 80% of the wages of a quarter of the working population, possibly, which is extraordinary. Um, and they had to put it all in place very quickly. So I think we do have to say against this back, that backdrop that it's a pretty extraordinary scheme to have to put in place and there's going to be teething problems. That said, I think one of the difficulties has been that instead of sort of giving a bit of time, announcing it, giving a bit of time and then coming up with one consolidated set of guidance about here's exactly how everything's going to work. Actually, we've had a bit of a drip feed of, well, oh, here's the guidance. Oh, actually, it's been changed. Here's a couple of clarifications and so on over a couple of weeks now. Um, we do, do seem now, I think literally today um, has come out probably the definitive guidance. We've got a yesterday. direct- Yesterday. Yesterday, thanks. Um, definitive direction to HMRC, um, which is now sort of the official guidance on how the furlough scheme is going to work. Um, I think, um, Susie, you can pick up in a second some of the details because there's some interesting things in there. I think the things I was going to point out as being still wrinkles are, one is, um, there's still nothing about how it interacts with holiday. And given that so far we've gone over a quite a major holiday period, Easter, um, it, it, it's surprising that there's nothing to describe what happens if somebody was gonna, gonna be on holiday for two weeks anyway, and is now being furloughed for four or six or whatever. And how do you make that work? Um, the other thing I think that's a bit of an issue potentially is that there are some things which were said in the original furlough guidance when it was first announced as a scheme which have now changed, which could mean that some people who are furloughed early, early on don't quite fall within the scheme. So one example of that is that originally it was said, if you just notify your, some of your staff as an employer that they're going to be furloughed, that's enough. You just notify them and you notify um, the government and that's, that's effective. The new direction says, well, actually you have to have a written agreement between the employer and employee 
doesn't say what format, doesn't say when, just says it's got to be a written agreement. That might mean there's quite a lot of employers who've acted in a way that wasn't now consistent with the definitive guidance. And I would hope that that's going to be worked out reasonably and that there won't be any issue raised about it, but it might raise a real problem for some. Susie, do you want to? Yeah, I was just going to say, Asda, um, I mean, because it's silent, don't you think that the employer and employee can now write an email even um, and say, well, we agree that you're furloughed. And so it's covered because it because it didn't stipulate it in the first place in the guidance. And because it's only because of the new Treasury direction that we know about it. I can't see realistically any employer or employee getting penalised for not having written it down in the first place and not agreed it. Um, that's the other point that I think is really important. Um, the Treasury direction now says that the employee has to agree it. Um, so previously, the employer, um, and I mean in writing, sorry. So the employee always had to agree it. And in the past in employment law, if an employer says something and an employee does not object to it um, within a certain period of time, the employee would have been deemed to have accepted what the employer had said. But now the Treasury direction makes it clear that the employee has to expressly agree and has to expressly agree in writing. So that's where I see the most difficulties coming in the future um, about how the coronavirus job retention scheme will actually operate because logistically that's a minefield isn't it imagine if you've got thousands and thousands of employees and you're fur furloughing thousands of those employees you need to ensure that each and every single one of them have gi has given express consent in relation to being furloughed so i think that's a really interesting point the other point, and I think this is something that maybe you can speak about, is um, the date now has changed. So previously, um, the employee had to be on the payroll on the 28th of February 2019, uh, 19, uh, sorry, 2020 rather, um, whereas now it's the 19th of March 2020. Um, but the snag is they have to, and I want to get this right because I am not a tax lawyer, um, essentially they need to have notified HMRC on an RTI submission, so that's a real-time information system, um, on or before the 19th of March 2020. Um, now, where I see there being difficulties is, let's say, for example, you were technically employed by someone before the 19th of March, and you were going to be on the next payroll because often you start and then you don't go on to the payroll until say April. Um, and I can see that there could potentially be some public law issues. That's not my realm, but I know Alistair, um, that is yours. And maybe you, you can answer that. Um, what do you see happening in the future in relation to that? How do you see the tribunal um, interpreting that where let's say someone hasn't got an RTI submission on or before the 19th of March 2020. Yeah I think um, I mean again I think I think it's it was well motivated it seems to be as you said to try and catch people who had sort of come onto the books as an employee but hadn't yet hit payroll and it's just trying to mm. deal with a potential snag there but the effect is that you could have people who it falls through the cracks and you suddenly got a mismatch between what people was expecting and then what actually happened. Um, and yeah, in terms of public law, the obvious thing that could be raised is a what's called a legitimate expectation argument. So if you're an employer, mm -hmm. a big employer for whom this is a real massive issue, or an employee, uh, employer who might be going out of business if you don't make this work, um, you might be able to say, look, we acted in this way because everything the government had put out suggested that we could we could do it this way and we can rely on that as um, a, a, a legitimate expectation we were given. Um, and if there's any suggestion, either by the government directly or by the employment tribunal, which is obviously a public authority acting in a case further down the line, that that's not how it, how it works, you could hold them to the original position. Um, it's going to be complicated, is the short answer. Um, I hope it won't arise in that many cases because it does mm. seem that for most people that that change in window of time will just be to do with them joining the payroll. But it's just another example of how 
goes back to this, what we started this whole program with. Um, a huge amount of legislation has been made in a very short space of time yeah. with no real scrutiny. I mean, we don't blame the politicians for that. They had to act quickly. In many ways, they've done a very good job. But my goodness, there's going to be problems. And we're just storing up lots of problems that are going to have to be worked through at some point. The one thing I would say on that point is, because there are a number of areas of ambiguity, there is a paragraph within the Treasury direction, 14.2 um, if anyone's interested, which does envisage that there may be some additional amendments to the directions. So it may be this isn't the final word. It certainly overtakes the guidance, um, but there may be further clarification along the line, which I think would be most welcome. I think so too. So we're coming towards the end of the episode um, and the end of our series. Um, I think I also wanted to end up by just kind of, now that we've created this overall picture of looking at everything to do with coronavirus from a health and social care perspective, from an education perspective, from a microeconomics perspective, macroeconomics, and now from the various aspects of the court system that we all deal with. Um, one fact that I think we can't escape from, and I think we have very diverse panels um, racially on the Manifesto Read, I think frankly just because I and I have diverse friendship circles that we tend to pull our panels from, um, but one statistic that's come out and has reached the headlines is the fact that it does feel and it does look and statistically has been shown that the communities that have been disproportionately affected uh, by the fallout from the coronavirus have been the Black, Asian and minority ethnic communities. And what I wanted to ask you guys was why you think that is. Um, have there been things or insights that you've had in terms of your lines of work uh, which have drawn out um, experiences that you can highlight to find those explanations for it? I mean, one thing to say, obviously, is something that Sam Bright touched upon in our last episode and I highlighted it as I think my favourite quote in this series which was we can't talk about progress we can't talk about any sort of positive um, pr um, pointers out of coronavirus or anything else that happens if there are groups of people who are dying and that pandemics and issues always disproportionately affect those who come from the poorest backgrounds and as we know in the UK there is a disproportionately higher uh, number of people from BAME backgrounds who are in socially deprived areas but what has struck me is that it's not just people from those backgrounds who are disproportionately affected by it. Even when you look at the pictures of the healthcare workers who've died from coronavirus, it's same healthcare workers. What is going on? Like, why, why is this happening? Zainab, tell me. Oh God. So, <laughs> I, I wrote a lot about, it's something that I've been incredibly quite angry about. So I'm gonna caveat this section I'm gonna talk about um, by saying that I am very angry at the government because I think that the fact that they didn't seem to have a coherent and concrete plan in place for protecting people or establishing clear lockdown measures before COVID-19 really became an issue in Britain has meant that people have, in my view, died needlessly and unnecessarily. Um, and I think it's, it, it's, it's, that anger has hammered home even more because it's certain communities and people that have been disproportionately affected um, by the government's early decisions and their current actions or rather lack of action that has led to, you know, in my view, BAME, people from BAME communities, you know, being affected by COVID-19 disproportionately. Um, so just caveating that by saying I might go on a bit of an angry, <laughs> angry rant, so pull me back if I do. But... Um, Feel free, we love a rant on this podcast. <laughs> um, and just an example of that, actually, going back to the 28-year-old pregnant nurse that we were talking about, Mary Ajiwa Agyapong, um, she stopped working on the 12th, but by that point, many people were, had, were already thought to have been infected with the disease and were probably asymptomatic um, and it wasn't until around the 20th of March given give or take um, that date might be wrong but that was when the government kind of decided to put out guidance around who the most vulnerable in society were and they mentioned that you know letters would be sent to about 1.5 million people to ask them to stay home and those are the people who were in the at-risk group and they kind of detailed who those people were um, and that kind of enacted the shielding part of their coronavirus plan which was you know lock 
not a lot away, but you know, ask people who are most at risk of um, being severely affected by the, the disease and dying from it, keep them home. Um, and it wasn't then until the 23rd or so that the official lockdown measures were enacted anyway. So it's just, everything about this just seems like, unnecessary but going back to the BAME communities last week the head of the British Medical Association called on the government to urgently investigate if and why black Asian and other ethnic minority um, groups of people were more vulnerable to COVID-19 following reports that the first 10 doctors in the UK that died from the virus were all BAME um, black Asian and minority ethnic um, and today we found out that the government will launch an inquiry into this and I think it's very welcome um, again today, shout out to Tash for sending this, um, this um, quote in, um, but we found out that the Intensive Care National Audit and Research Centre found last week that 34% of critically ill coronavirus patients in England, Wales and Northern Ireland were from Black or minority ethnic backgrounds. Um, those are quite stark statistics um, and I think to talk about, to go into a bit more detail about this particular issue, I'm going to reference the work of three organisations or blog posts, reports and policy documents that they've written. Zainab, uh, hello. also interesting to note that of that and that 34 percent is also placed in context of the fact that 13 percent of the population are from Bay background. So I think it's important to kind of extrapolate that as well contextually. Yeah, exactly. It's a disproportionate representation, isn't it? Absolutely, absolutely. Um, so the three trust um, organisations I'm going to reference in this bit, is, um, and everybody feel free to kind of chime in um, with your thoughts and comments, because I'm sure there are many, um, are the Ronnie Mead Trust, um, Charity So White, and also um, something from Amnesty International UK. Um, each of these organisations have it's written extensively on the disproportionate impact of COVID-19 and the impact that it's having on Bain communities and listing the reasons why um, charity so white talk you know they give actual rec recommendations as well to tackling the issue um, so kind of diving into running me trust um, so BAME groups in the UK are among the poorest socio socio-economic groups structural inequalities that place BAME groups at a much higher risk of civil in it severe illness from COVID, as well as experiencing the harsher economic impacts from the government's measures to slow the spread of the virus. And I think a lot of the things that I've been reading um, about some of the comments are, you know, well, BAME people are more likely to be unhealthy or, you know, have, you know, specific health um, health problems. Um, I think the latter is probably true. We do, we are more like, we are probably more likely to have things like high blood pressure in certain um, communities. Um, but I, I want us to get away from that just a little bit, just because I, I think that that will just be a blame game. It's not really tackling the reasons why BAME communities are suffering from health inequalities. It's not just because we are more healthy, there's, sorry, less healthy. There are other things we, we can look into as in, poverty, more likely to live in um, multi-generational households or overcrowded accommodation. Um, and that's something that the Running Me Trust, Trust also talk about. Um, in terms of employment, um, the race disparity audit highly, highlighted that BAME groups were on average twice as likely to be unemployed than their white count British counterparts and more likely in um, specifically Pakistani and Bangladeshi groups to be in low skilled or low paying occupations. Um, another thing to note is that, you know, people from within the BAME community um, are, they make up about, uh, sorry, I'm just looking at my stats here. Um, they are more likely to be in the key worker groups, for example. So they're more likely to be the care workers, they're more likely to be the nurses working in um, the NHS, more likely to be the, the porters and the cleaners that are cleaning the hospital. All of that's, that's the exact point I wanted you to get, because when you go into a shop yeah, <laughs> and you're being served by that diligent shopkeeper who right. has been, you know, ser selling you the toilet paper that you wanted, the eggs, the pint of milk, they are far more likely to be a non-white of a non-white background than a white background and I think I think that's just so forgotten and when you look at for example the portrayal in the media of the NHS staff mm -hmm. I was appalled at how white that portrayal was it wasn't until these deaths were racked up that you started to see 
newspapers like the mirror of all places yeah. you know, plastering brown faces on the front covers and demanding questions of the government as to why it was that healthcare workers were dying why they didn't have PPE but it took until then before that representation even came to light didn't it right. like it wasn't it's not how it started no. Annie and Tom you guys had, had your hands up Tom you're on mute yeah I, w I wanted to make a, an observation and this is not necessarily um a political one by definition it may well be but I, I <laughs> not but who for the best part of well, I don't know, all of his career but particularly when he was a uh, leader of the opposition went on about inequality and raised it time and time and time again who was uh, lambasted by elements of the right-wing media lambasted by um um uh, the government when he would stand up in uh, parliament and tell the individual stories and what this pandemic does it, it exposes fundamental inequality in society unlike anything we have seen in decades because those who can run off to their second homes those who can go down the park those who can um, afford the, um, the, the, the prices that undoubtedly are going to hit their pockets. Those are the people who will be fine. And I say that, um, obviously, understanding that this pandemic has had a profound effect on other, other people, but those, the, um, the bus drivers, the NHS workers, the cleaners, those people who are, leave, who are uh, living paycheck to paycheck, those are the people who will struggle. And I just wonder what it says about us as a country when we look back at this and we see, we see those people, uh, those frontline workers, um, the, the, the public sector workers who didn't get their pay increases. We all remember the uh, rather unfortunate language that Brexit brought to, um, brought to the forefront of our political discourse. And it's now that we're seeing that those people are the people who are putting their lives at risk on a daily basis. Absolutely. To our hospitals are clean, our uh, buses, uh, uh, public transport's working. Um, and I just think um, those who um, care very little about the suffering of others should really reflect after this time is, is over and ask yeah. themselves, would I be alive if it wasn't for those? But for the service of, of others? Exactly. I just want to throw in a quick stat about the NHS workers before um, I think someone else had their hand. I think yeah. But, um, so BME healthcare workers are disproportionately affected because they're mostly exposed, they're probably more exposed to the virus or to patients than the ordinary person. But one in five NHS workers are from BAME backgrounds. And in London specifically, BAME staff represent 44% in the entire NHS workforce. Exactly. I, I just, uh, yeah, you know, I don't think I need to add anything more to that. I think those stats just speak for themselves. And um, we're going to wrap up um, very shortly. I know that, that that Fiona has been waiting because I know that for you have um, some points to make in relation to the use of police powers under the Coronavirus Act. Susie, I, I saw that you had your hand up and, Al, and Ali as well. Um, and then we will wrap up um, after that because we've got, because we have gone over. Yeah, just a, a couple of points. One is in relation to the point that Tom was raising about the Brexit attitudes that we saw. And the Daily Mail currently has the headline Romanians to the rescue because Romanians have now been chartered to pick um, the fruit vegetables that British people aren't willing to do. So I think that's an interesting turn of <laughs> Um, but in terms of the police powers, you know, we already know that there is a disproportionality of, um, uh, uh, of BAME individuals in the justice system. The, the um, police powers and how they're being exercised, I, I know there's been a lot of criticism of the police and to be fair to them, they tend to be giving out guidance rather than actually finding people or arresting them. But Marie Deneau was a black female. And in the last week, we've seen a black male who was threatened with being pepper sprayed and ultimately arrested, who was, um, or, or 
it said, at least, we don't know whether it is correct or not, but said he was um, delivering food to a vulnerable relative. Now, he was ultimately de-arrested, but what has sort of been the, the quiet tagline at the end is he was fined. So he has still been penalised um, for his actions, which may actually have been reasonable. And um, you have to wonder, you know, for instance, Marie Denou, were she a white woman, stood in Newcastle uh, train station looking at where she was going, would that have been described as loitering? Would the police have gone over and had words of advice for her or would they have gone over and arrested her? Uh, and yes, I know that some are, uh, some people take the view of, well, didn't um, help herself by refusing to give her details. She didn't have to give her details. And you again have to take the, this, this, wondering about would that attitude have been taken um, with the incident last week? Would that have escalated to pepper spray? Would that man have even been stopped if he was a white male? And so we are seeing the same disproportionality that we've always seen in the justice system still playing out. And, and that's something that's definitely concerning for me. Yeah, I echo everything that you've just said, Fiona. Um, Ali, what did you want to say? Well, just two really short things um, arising from what everyone else I was really interested in listening to everyone else. I think one point I was going to make is simply we really need to get some proper data on all of this. I mean, that's true of the whole coronavirus thing. And that's why it's encouraging the government's going to do some kind of inquiry into this point about um, disproportionate impact on, on certain ethnic groups, because um, it's we just need to know, is this because... Um, for instance, it's because there's so many more ethnic minority people um, in certain professions or certain um, frontline um, sort of uh, workforces dealing with the coronavirus, which still seems to be an issue. Is it a geographical thing? Is it because London and the West Midlands have been the worst hit and there's a higher BAME uh, population in those areas? Or is it something much more deep seated and, and potentially more sinister um, that we really need to tackle? And I think a key thing is going to be we need to find out because this 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 could be really serious. Um, the second thing I was going to say is just to echo um, what Zainab um, and Tom have been saying about I really hope one thing that might happen long term as a result of this pandemic. Who knows what the world's going to be like on the other side of it? Um, I have to say I'm slightly cynical. I think people will probably bounce back to normal more than I'd like, but I'd like to hope there'll be some positive change. And I think one of them might be that we will stop taking for granted a lot of people in our society who are, it turns out, essential. And we'll start valuing them more than the people who frankly get paid most at the moment um, and get the, the highest status jobs and actually we're discovering aren't that important um, compared to our cleaners and shelf stackers and nurses and so on. Yeah, I think definitely. Um, I, I think that the mere, the mere fact that key worker is being associated with so many of these professions. I hope they're still seen as that after um, this pandemic is over and feeding back to what Tom Noel said as well. I think it's quite interesting that a lot of these policies that are being put in place now as a sticking plaster were points which the Lib Dems and Labour and Green and so on had in their manifestos as fundamental changes that ought to have been brought about in a, you know, in a matter, in a, in a time where things seem to be going well. So that these aren't provisions that we sort of bring in to try and heal a much wider problem. Okay, guys, we do need to wrap up. Um, I knew this episode was going to overrun, partly because one, I was the person who was in charge of timing, and secondly, because it's full of lawyers. Um, but it's the last in our series. I want to thank everyone, all of you guys. I want to thank everyone from all of the other panels who've taken the time to join in. There's a lot of preparation that goes to each of these episodes. A lot of last minute emails from me asking people to learn how to use Google Docs and write out their contributions before the episodes as well. Um, so I'm extremely grateful to everyone. I just wanted to mention two podcasts that you guys might want to tune into if you have enjoyed the manifesto read. Um, one is called Criminal Justice on Trial and that is from Jeremy Dean QC who is one of the heads of my set of chambers and he speaks to prisoners, families of prisoners, prison governors, ministers and so on about the experiences of people who've been affected by uh, Covid uh, with people who are in custody and a new po podcast which is launching from the Young Lawyers Association called Law With Us which we 
actually launched on the 24th of April, which will be similar to this setup, but one to one conversations with predominantly lawyers who work in various areas of law, um, talking about their experience of adjusting to COVID-19 and how it has affected their clients as well as their own practices and so on. Um, so yeah, thank you guys once again. But we're done for this particular series and I and I can go back to being normal people um, and having actual lives. Be great, won't it, Io? Oh, I don't know. I think I've, I've got Stockholm Syndrome. I've been slave to this thing for weeks and weeks and then <laughs> it's going to be done. And then, I don't know, it feels kind of bittersweet. We, we can still be podcast husband and wife. You'll still get messages from me every so often with random ideas about Instagram posts and so on. Okay, so if, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm reassured that if that still happens, then that, <laughs> that provides some solace. You know, that's cool. Great. Okay. All right. So everyone, unmute yourselves. Let's all say bye and let's go about our lives again. Bye. Bye, bye guys. Bye. Thank you. Bye.